Isn't it? Absolutely. Are you glad to be in church this morning? Good, good. Would you turn to our text that we've been looking at for some weeks now in the book of Matthew? Matthew chapter 16. Anybody know what we've been talking about? The church. The church. The title of the series is The Church. It's not just a Sunday thing. Right? The church. Let's look at our text again, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16 and verse 13. Jesus asked his disciples, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah. Others say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Verse 15, he said to them, But whom say you that I am? You know, what you say about Jesus makes all the difference. Right? What you believe about him makes the difference in being saved and lost in your eternity, your life here and your life later. Peter speaks up and says, You are... The Christ, the Son of the living God. Boy, that's the revelation now, isn't it? I mean, how many wish, all, wish the whole world knew that and believe that? What a different place it'd be. What do you believe about Him? Said out loud, He is, he is the, Christ, the Christ, the Son the Son of the living God, the living God. and He's my Lord. Glory to God. If you believe that in your heart and believe that God's raised him from the dead, you're saved. Let's say it again. If you're watching my TV or internet, say it right out loud. Don't be ashamed. Say it right out loud. Say it out loud. He is, he is the, Christ, the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he's my Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, the fle- for flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. He got this uh, straight from the Father God. And I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock, or some translations say stone, I'll build my, uh, excuse me, upon this rock I'll build my church. Peter is a word for rock or stone, like one that could be moved. But when he says, upon this rock, I'll build my church. That's another word like the rock of a mountain. What rock does he, is he building his church on? The rock of the Christ, the Son of the living God. On this rock, I will build my church. This is the Master speaking. What did he say? I will build my church. Church, is it important to him? Is it a priority to him? Does he value this? Should we value it? We should value what he values. His priority should be our priority. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Amplified says, Uh, I will build my church. The gates of Hades, the powers of the infernal region, shall not overpower it or be strong to its detriment or hold out against it. Now, I like that. And I think sometimes just reading over that phrase, people don't see that part. But the gates of hell shall not prevail. Hell won't overcome the powers and authority works of hell. Won't overcome the church. Well, that's true. But there's another part of it too. Hell cannot hold out against us. <laughs> gates, all, gates work to keep people out. But gates also hold people in. Oh, can you see this now? And millions are held in bondage 
by the powers of darkness, keeping them blind and keeping them deceived. But how? what's going to happen as the Lord builds His church? Where do these building materials come from? They come from behind the gates <laughs> of darkness. Those that are in darkness, they come. How many, I like what Brother Reinhard Bonnke said. He said, hell empty and heaven full. Right? That, that's the charge. That's the vision. So the powers, the authority, the work of hell cannot overpower and overwhelm and defeat the church, nor can it hold out against the church. We're not just on the defensive. We are on the offensive. We are on the move. Does that bear witness with your spirit? We're not supposed to just have our little church and get in the corner of town and hope nobody notices us and pray that we can hold on till Jesus comes. No, we're supposed to be the candle on top of the lampstand, the city on the hill. We're supposed to say, here we are. you got to look at us. We're not going away. We're not going to shut up. We won't back down. Jesus is Lord and we're not ashamed of the gospel. Yes, we speak in tongues. Yes, we believe in miracles. And yes, we're rich. And we give God all the glory and all the powers of hell. Can't stop it and can't hold us out. You can shout the rest of the day just right there now, couldn't you? Glory to God. He said on this rock, I will build my church. What is the church? Let me review just a little bit for you. What is the church? We said, specifically speaking, technically, I guess maybe a better word, the church are the called together ones. We are called out of and from All walks of life, all, every tribe, every kindred, every nation, every tongue, right? Uh, Every background, every language, as as we said. Uh, But we're not just called out, we are called together. Now this is really important. Without unity, there is no church. No functional church. We are called, but we're not just called out from, we are called to gather. We are joined together. Uh, What is the church? The church of the Lord is also the body of the Lord. The body is joined together, every part. The church is also the bride. Or the wife of the Lord. Well, how many know the husband and the wife are joined together? These two will be one, he said. And what God has joined together, then don't let any man separate. The church is the house of God. Well, a house is joined together. Right? Part upon part. Foundation and and walls and and roof and, and room to room. The church is the family of God. Well, the family is joined together, joined by blood, joined by spirit, joined by love, and joined by the one and the self-same vision and commission. Go to Ephesians quickly, if you would. Ephesians, the fourth chapter. There's a lot in this wonderful epistle about the church. Ephesians. If you want to get stirred up about the church, get to reading in Ephesians here, and you'll get stirred up. The called together ones, the joined together ones, the gathered together, growing up together, working together, headed to heaven together, <laughs> going to live together in eternity Forever. Together. 
I know, uh, uh, hmm, should I say that, Lord? Hmm, maybe I can say it without saying that. Uh, <laughs> you're not supposed to say everything you know. Did you know that? Uh, if, you, uh, if you do, the Lord will know you can't keep any secrets. And He won't tell you other things. And I don't want that to happen. Uh, I have a conviction, let me say it like this, that God's joinings extend past this life. Ecclesiastes says what God does, it is forever. And uh, uh, it is no coincidence or happenstance that you are born in a certain place at a certain time and that God drew you to a certain church or to a certain ministry or with other brothers and sisters. This is not happenstance. This is not chance. The Lord is ordering our steps. And He, jo- he has placed every one of us in the body as it has pleased Him, and the body part that's on this side of you is as it has pleased Him, and the body part that's on this side, and on this side, and on this side, and I believe it is forever. So you better get happy about who you're working with (laughs) now. (laughs) You could be seeing them for a long, long, long time. (laughs) <laughs> but me too I, I like I, brother, brother Hagen used to say this all the, all the time I like the company I run with there's no better company than God's company company well what's a company that's splintered and divided no we have to be together the church is the called joined growing up working Together ones in Ephesians 4, verse 3. Ephesians 4, 3 says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We're to endeavor to keep this. There is one body, one Spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who's above all and through all and in you all. Somebody say one. 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 Now, churches are called by many different names, many different denominations, but really there's only one church. One church. And it doesn't operate under the banner of any singular denomination. If you are born again, you're in the church. If you're not born again, I don't care how many times you've been baptized, sprinkled, how many rosters you're on, how many preachers or priests you know, if you hadn't been born again, you're not in the church. Thanks be unto God, we have been taken and translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. We've been baptized, the Bible says, into the body of Christ. Oh, glory to God. Oh, glory to God. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is forever, my friends. And it's going to become increasingly, uh, uh, you know, revelation to us and real to us what this means as the days go by and particularly as the centuries go by when people look and say, who are they? Who are those glorious ones? Who are the ones robed in white? Who are the ones who get to stay with the Master all the time, who live with Him, who are in His presence, who rule and reign with Him? They are not angels. Who are they? Who are they? They are the called together ones. They are the glorious ones. They are the church. The church of the Lord Jesus. (laughs) Glory to God. Hallelujah. 
Well, I want you to stay as excited about the later part of this message <laughs> as this part, <laughs> because it all goes together. The Lord is building His church. It is His focus. It is His priority. I mean, what is more important to Him happening in the earth than this? Someone said, well, souls being saved. That's what I just said. That's building the church. Well, His people growing up and developing and getting out of uh, darkness and oppression, that is building the church. Right? What's more important to Him in the earth than building the church? Is He able to build His church? Is He? To build it numerically and in strength and in every way, is He able to build His church? Then, and this, don't hear this wrong, but if so, why has the church developed so slowly? We're talking about century after century, right? Yes. After century, generation after generation, and you find, you find again and again generations where there were many, many, many more people out of the church than in the church. What, and, and, and we like to, you know, maybe think that uh, most of the world's population is like us. And believes in the Lord, but no, there are millions and millions and millions who don't believe in the Lord Jesus, right? He is is not their Lord, and they don't believe in the church, and they're not a part of the church. What is the holdup? What is the hindrance of the Lord building His church? That's the message for today. Can you take it? Are you ready for it? Do you want to hear it? What is hindering the Lord building His church? There's obviously things hindering. Right? Why hasn't every successive generation swept the earth? Hmm? And people, you know, the, the, the... vast majority of the earth come on into the church every generation. What, what's been the hindrance? I want you to see one big one. Go to the book of Acts. Acts, the seventh chapter. Now, don't lose all your excitement. <laughs> Don't, don't lose the victory. Everything we just shouted about is still true. Hmm? <laughs> How many know we not only need, you know, stuff that's sweet and we like to eat, but we also need uh, greens, <laughs> Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Your body needs all these things, right? Whether you, all, whether you like the taste of one thing as well as the other is another thing, but uh, adults uh, realize that they are to do things and receive things that's not as fun as other things, but that they can be necessary. Acts 7. Acts 7 and down in verse 35, excuse me, uh, Acts 7, 35. He said, This Moses whom they refused, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought him out. After he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses which said to the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up to you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear. Who's he talking about? Jesus. 
This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the, the nation and the people of Israel that Moses was leading. They are here called the church in the wilderness. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spoke to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give to us to whom our fathers would not obey but thrust him from them and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. And it went on to say, you know, they told Aaron, uh, make gods to go before us. As for this Moses that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. Now, it hadn't been that long. Forty days, right? How quickly they forgot their deliverer and their leader. Now, hold, hold this place and go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. And you'll see what we're, what we're getting at, what we're talking about here. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not have you, not, excuse me, not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They did all eat the same spiritual meat. They did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual what? Rock. What? Rock. What's the, where's the Lord going to build His church? Rock. On this They drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Peter. First bishop of the church. No, I'm sorry, but no, that rock was and is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now he's talking about the generation of Israelites that were delivered out of Egyptian bondage, isn't he? That's who he's talking about. We know they are referred to as the church in the wilderness. Under Moses' leadership. And it said, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. They were disqualified. Now these things were our what? Examples. Our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they lusted, neither be idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for what? Examples, Examples to who? Us. 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 The church in the wilderness is a type and an example for the church, us. Are you with me now? He went on to say, all these things happen to them for in samples. They're written for our admonition. We're supposed to learn something and be instructed from this. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Now, when we're talking about what hinders the church from taking the earth, what hinders the church from spreading across this globe and sweeping the masses in, what hinders us from taking the land? Does that sound familiar? The church in the wilderness had something before them. That they were to take. Right? That they were to possess. They were to have victory after victory after victory. And they were to gain ground. And the people too. Right? I mean, the people that survived the possession were supposed to become believers in Jehovah. And their successive seed after them. And the nations were supposed to come in. Right? 
Why didn't they do it? What kept them out? How many know the first generation that was delivered from Egyptian bondage, they did not go in and possess the land, right? And build the kingdom that God had designed for them. They did not. They wandered and went around in circles out in that hot, dry, barren place. Didn't they? Until that whole generation... Uh, of warriors died out. And even when Joshua led the other ones in, they did not possess it fully. Now, have you been reading your chapters? You're getting into this. And you're really seeing this if you're reading your chapters every day. If you haven't, get with us now. Go back and get your bookmarker and and, and read Monday's chapter and and Tuesday's. Stay with us on this. This will help you. Why didn't they go in? Why didn't they possess And have all and build all that God had given. They are an example to us. And the same spiritual reasons will be true for us as for them. Go to Hebrews, please, the third chapter. What hinders the church? What is holding the church back? What is hindering the building of the church? In Hebrews, the third chapter. Hebrews chapter 3, are you there? Hebrews 3 and 7. Well, let me read verse 6. But Christ is a son over his own house. We know the church is also his house. Whose house are we? We are his church. We are his house. If... We hold the beginning, or excuse me, hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost says, today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts. As in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and I said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. What kept them out? What kept them? Verse 12, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you. Are they examples for us? Can the same thing happen to us that happened to them? Absolutely, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now, you can answer this in one word. What kept them out of all that God had prepared for them? Unbelief. We, we know that. Those of us that have uh, looked at faith and heard faith talk, we know that. that. That is an answer to the question. And that's an answer to the church's issue today. What is holding the church back? What is keeping the church back from doing all that it's supposed to do in the earth? It's true. Unbelief. Unbelief, fear and unbelief will hold you out, will keep you out. But I don't think we've seen as much what's connected to this. It's easy to say unbelief, but notice he's already mentioned one thing and he says it again in verse uh, 13. Exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 19 says, We see they could not enter in because of what? Because of unbelief. This unbelief was not an ignorant unbelief. It was a rebellious unbelief. Go to the Old Testament, please, in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 9. Are you all with me today? Believe with me for utterance. Deuteronomy 9. What holds the church back? Same thing that held them back. We know the answer is unbelief. But did you see how many other times he said hardness? Hardness. This hardness uh, is inseparable from the unbelief. 
The unbelief and hardness are hand in hand. That's why the unbelief is like it is. Deuteronomy 9. Deuteronomy 9. And uh, six. Now we've been reading these things, haven't we? Yes. Deuteronomy nine six says, "Understand therefore that the Lord your God gives you not this good land to possess it for your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. Stiff-necked." That, that what we're reading in Acts, where he talked about the church in the wilderness, I didn't finish reading it, but all on down to the 51st verse, uh, Stephen had told them, he said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so you do. Somebody say stiff-necked. stiff-necked. What does that mean, stiff-necked? Doesn't mean you've got physical problems with your neck. Huh? What would be the opposite of stiff necked? <laughs> Loose neck. <laughs> Stiffen your neck for me. Let me see what it looks like. Hmm? Stiff. What is stiff? Unyielding. Unyielding. Hard. Ungiving. Unyielding, stiff neck, and many tra- many modern translations say stubborn. Yes, yes. Stubborn. He said, "Let me let me keep reading here." Verse seven. Well, verse six. You are a stiff necked people. Remember and forget not how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that you did depart out of the land of Egypt until you come into this place. You have been rebellious against the Lord. Rebellious against the Lord. Skip down to verse, uh, let's see, verse 13. Furthermore, the Lord spoke to me saying, I have seen this people. And behold, it is a stiff-necked people, unyielding, stubborn. Let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven. I'll make of you a nation mightier and greater than they. What kept them out? Now let's go through this slowly. What kept them? People say, well, unbelief. Okay. But why the unbelief? It was not an unbelief based on ignorance. Did they know what God's plan for them was? Yes, they did. Did they know what they're supposed to do? They're supposed to go in and take the land. Did they know it? Yes, they knew it. Why didn't they do it? He said, he said, you're stiff-necked. You're stubborn. You're rebellious. Keep on reading. He said down in verse 22, he said at Taborah and at Massa and Kiproth Hateva, we, you provoked the Lord to wrath. Likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea saying, go up and possess the land which I've given you. And then you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord. They did what? Rebelled. Was it an ignorant mistake? No. Did they just not know any better? No. no, they knew exactly what he had said to them to do. And they rebelled against it. You rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and you be- believed Him not to hearken to His voice. Verse 24. You have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. From day one until now, you have been rebellious. Now let's examine this. What kept them out? Was it the giants? That kept them from going in. Was it the walled cities? No. Was it ignorance? They just didn't know what God wanted. No. No. What kept them out? It was unbelief. But if you look up that word, you know, Paul said he did some things ignorantly in unbelief. Persecuting the church before he got saved. But this is different. This is what I call, and if you look up the definitions, it bears it out, an unpersuadable 
unbelief. You know better. You know. But you just refuse. So what kept them out? It was God's plan. It was God's will. Was He able to bring them into the land? He proved it with Joshua, didn't He? Was He able to give them the victories over the giants? To get them into the walled city? Was He able to do it? Yes. What kept them out? Their own stubbornness. Their own rebellion. What's holding the church back today? Exactly the same thing. Many want to believe it's ignorance. And don't misunderstand me. There's plenty of ignorance around. (laughs) There's plenty of ignorance about God and the things of God. But even that is again and again the result of rebellion. Did you hear me? I know, Phyllis and I know a few things about God today. A few. But do you know how we learned them? Hmm? We learned them because years ago the Lord put His finger on us and said, Go do this. Now go do this. Now do this. At any one of those places, had we said, No, I don't want to do that. We would have stopped learning. And we would have been much more ignorant today than we are. And people thought, well, I can't help it. I just don't know. Yeah, but if you'd have followed God, you would have found out. Oh, can you see this? So much of the ignorance is because of rebellion. Are y'all with me or not on this? (laughs) Why do people not like to hear about rebellion? (laughs) Wonder why people would kind of get quiet and go. (laughs) Brother Keith, you're going to talk about this the whole time? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, this is it. This is today's message. (laughs) What holds your kids back from success? What keeps you back from success? What keeps the church back from success? People like to think it's ignorance. Well, it's unbelief. Well, it is. But why? Because of stubbornness. And you're going to see this. It's not just my idea now. This is the thing that can't be fixed. Now, that, that's a big statement. And I want you to see, I'm going to show you scripture on it before we get through here. But if you get stubborn and hard, and you can do it acting sweet. You can do it acting so sweet and nice. You can go, no, well, I, yes, yes, I understand. But inside you, you're a brick wall. You've made up your mind. I ain't moving. Hmm? I am not giving in. I am not giving in and you can't make me. <laughs> now, some people think this is a sign that you are strong and that you're nobody's doormat and nobody can run over you and you're going to let everybody know it. Let me tell you, you do this with God, with His people, with His things, you can get yourself in a place where it can't be fixed. Now that's what somebody said, what about God? That's what I said. Where If you get like that and won't change and won't repent, you can get yourself in a place where it can't be fixed by anybody. That's serious. I said that's serious. Is there another option? What what could you do? <laughs> Instead of being stiff necked, what could you do? You, he he said, you stiff necked and uncircumcised, circumcised in heart and mind. He said, you always resist the Holy Ghost. Instead of resisting, what can you do? Yeah. You can yield. You can give. You can give in. You can yield. You can humble yourself. You can repent. 
What does the Bible say? If, if you hide your sin, you won't prosper. But if you'll confess and forsake it, you get mercy. God resists the proud. Well, what? it's sowing and reaping. What are the proud doing? They're resisting Him. What's this hardness, this stiffness? What's that? That's resistance. No. I think people in healing lines, bless their heart. I come through laying hands on people. I've seen this more than once. And people do like this, like. I just look at you like, you can't knock me down. I'm not trying to knock anybody down. But that resistive is not a receiving mode. Hmm? And we have, we have, th- this is rampant through the earth. Th- th- this is all through the body of Christ. This rebellion, that's why churches don't stay together. They keep splitting and, and splitting and families don't stay together. Why? Because people get to that sticking point. Anybody know what I mean by that? They're talking, they're having conversation, they're dealing with things, and then they stick. What do you mean? They are not moving. They are not going to give in. They are not going to yield. And when this happens with husband and wife, when it happens in, in business, it happens in, in church, I don't care where it happens, if that does not change, that relationship has to fall. Did you hear me? That sticking point. <clears throat> Somebody say, praise the, Lord. praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He said to them, he said, you have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. You know, uh, Numbers 13, turn there. Let's look at Numbers 13 and Numbers 14, these two chapters for just a moment. If you're visiting with us today, you might realize by now that noon is not our regular get out time. <laughs> Numbers 13. Numbers 13. And we, we, we've read already that at this juncture, when they were supposed to go in and take the land, they rebelled against the Lord. Numbers 13.30, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us, everybody say us. us. Let us go up at once and possess it for we, everybody say we. We, we are well, oh, well able to overcome it. Now, we've talked about this before. One had put a thousand to flight. Two will do what? Much, not, not just two thousand, but there's a multiplied effect. Right? Can three of us do what the church is supposed to do in the earth? Three of us. Three churches, local churches. Can we do the job of the church, the church in the earth? The answer is no. Let me ask you this. Could Caleb and Joshua take it by themselves? Did they take it by themselves? No, they could not, and they did not. They wandered around out there with the rest of the, re- the rest of the bunch that was rebellious, even though they had another spirit, right? They had a, a submissive to God, faith in God. Let's overcome it, let's get it, let's take it now, spirit. But they could not take it by themselves. The same thing is true today. What's holding the church back from taking everything that's been given to us, from advancing in the earth with the speed and the power that it is the will of God? What's what's hindering and holding back the building of the church to the degree and on the scale that is the Lord's plan and will? Five of us can't do this. Five churches can't do this. Hmm? Hmm? We don't like to think about it, but enough rebellion can hold the rest of us back. Enough insubordination, enough stubbornness, enough refusal to believe and refusal to obey 
holds the rest of us back. Well, we can't control everybody. But we can control ourselves. We can see to it that we're not rebellious. That we're not stubborn. And if some other stubborn folk hold us back, we can believe God to live long enough like they did. (laughs) Till they all get out of the way. Right? And we go on in. Anyhow, they didn't quit. Read it again. Read it again. What did he say? Caleb still the people before Moses. What did he say? Let who? Us. Let us go up at once and possess it. For we are we. We. I. Me and Caleb can do it? No. Uh Uh-uh. They couldn't do it. They couldn't. No need for us to overestimate what we can do alone. We've got to have each other. In order to get the big stuff done, we've got to work together. There's enough of us. There's enough of us right now in this country, in the U.S., to stop anything we don't like. There's enough of us already saved here, alive, right now. We could change any law. We could remove any leader. We could put anybody in. Somebody says, well, what if something's going on here that we don't like it? We could pool our money and buy that city. We could. We could buy the company and bulldoze it. We could buy all of them and put them out of business. We, I can't do it, you can't do it, but we could do it. We, the body of Christ. What is preventing that kind of power? I told you before, I saw a a revelation. I actually had a, a vision inside myself. When I first began to study this, I saw the devil's fear of the church. I knew it, but I didn't know it like I know it now. I saw it. What does he fear? He fears us getting together (laughs) and using our combined faith, our combined anointing, our combined resources. When he thinks about what we can do to him and his operations in the earth together, panic comes over him. He has panic attacks. I saw it. It sweeps over him. He's a fear monger. He's sown fear for centuries and it comes back on him. So what has he been doing nonstop? He's been working, working to in, in, what's the word? Inject and manifest his nature in us through our flesh. What is his nature? Rebellion. I said rebellion. He is the one who invented the no. I'm not and you can't make me. (laughs) Hmm? No. No, I am not going to serve God where I was created. I will exalt my throne. I will be like the Most High. Ah, rebellion, rebellion, stubbornness, it's His nature. And you ought to hate it. I said you ought to hate it. Because it is the enemy of God. It has caused God so much trouble in heaven and on the earth. Said out loud, by the grace of God. I will not be stubborn. I will not be rebellious. I will not be disobedient. I will yield myself unto the Lord and unto His. Glory to God. Glory to God. I will yield myself. I will yield myself. Bless the Lord. Turn with me. Turn with me to other scripture here. Let's... Let's go further in this. In the 29th chapter of Proverbs, turn there please. What kept them out? 
It was unbelief. But why was the unbelief there? It was this stubbornness. This hard-headedness. Proverbs 29 says what I was mentioning to you earlier about what a serious thing this is. Proverbs 29 and 1. 29 and 1, are you there? He that being often reproved and does what? Hardens his neck. What will happen? Shall suddenly... How many know you can't keep resisting the Lord indefinitely and it go well with you? He is merciful. He is very gracious. He is long-suffering. He is slow to anger. But He can be angered. Right? And you, you can push it to the point where judgment will come on you. The Bible, that happened concerning the Israelites, that first generation. They ignored Him, and they rebelled against Him, and they disobeyed Him. The Bible said ten different major times. And on that tenth time, in that thirteenth and fourteenth chapter we were just reading there, He said, that's it. That's it. What you've been saying out of your mouth is going to happen. You are going to die in the wilderness. They got to a place where it couldn't be fixed. And, and, and they all cried and repented when they saw what kind of shape they're in now with the Lord. And then they said, well, okay, okay, we'll go. We'll go. We'll go up right now and take it. And he told them through Moses, no, don't you go. You stay right where you are. So what did they do? So they rebelled again, which shows they have not changed. Right? They're faced with this thing and nothing has, they've cried, but nothing has changed. No, 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 we're going to go. We said we're going to go and we're going to go. Moses said, you better stay home. And they went on anyway. And they got defeated. Is it true what he said about them? He said, you stiff-necked, rebellious, you've been rebellious from the day I met you until now. And that was the thing that they, that they could not get past and could not get fixed because they would not change. If you've been reproved repeatedly and you do what? Read, read the text now here. You do what? Me, you, anybody. Harden our set, stiffen our net. What does that mean? Resist. You, you're stuck. He ain't going to make me do it. I don't care. I'm not. They're wrong. No. Can you do that indefinitely and not have problems? You do that too many times, what's going to happen? Destruction will come on you suddenly. Read the rest of it. What? What does that mean? There's no fixing it. There's no cure for it without remedy. Now, I know a lot of people don't like to hear this, but we need to see how serious stubbornness, hard-headedness, rebellion, and disobedience is. And I, I believe from the Scripture and from the, the, the sense in my own spirit, this is the major thing that's holding the whole church back. Just like it was the major thing that was holding the church in the wilderness back. The devil's not holding us back. I said the devil's not holding us back. Other religions are not holding us back. The governments of the earth are not holding us back. If they are, they're bigger than God. They're not. They're not. Any more than the walled cities and the giants held them back. He that being often reproved. Read another translation here. The, t today's English version. Listen to this. If you get more stubborn every time you are corrected, one day you'll be crushed and never recover. Let me read this to you. If you get more stubborn every time you are corrected, one day you'll be crushed and never recover. The living says, the man who is often reproved but refuses to accept criticism 
will suddenly be broken and never have another chance. This is serious. I said, this is serious. You know, when you are corrected or when you're instructed or when you're reproved of the Lord from the Word in a time of prayer, in a service like this, through another brother or sister or leader or whoever, you'll do one of two things. When you see light that puts you in not such a good light, (laughs) right? Light that shows up your mistakes, your failure, your shortcoming. You'll do one of two things. You'll either humble yourself and, uh, and do what? Repent. Or you will harden yourself and resist. Say that out loud. Humble, humble. and repent. Now, see, repent involves receiving. Or what, we, what else could you do? You, see, while somebody's talking to you, you can get madder and madder. And more and more upset. And, what, and, and, and this. <laughs> and you can use all kind of religi- religious language, but it's the same ugly stuff. Bless God. I'm not going to give in to this. That can put you in a place where there is no recovery. There is no help for you. I know that's a strong thing, but it's the truth. Yes, it is. I know uh, I hadn't been in the ministry but just a little while. And uh, I had some people helping me. This is decades ago. And uh, one of them did something that I had told them not to do, and it caused a problem. Well, two of them were involved. I called them in, and my plan is for us to deal with this, them see it, go right back to work the next day. That's my plan. Well, I said, now guys, I said, uh, this is not right, and I hold you responsible you could have done differently. And you, you, you should have done this. And this would have been different. What made them mad? They stiffened themselves. Well, I just don't see it that way. I said, well, I think you're seeing wrong. Well, that's not how I have it in my heart. And I don't take responsibility for that. And, and I think you're wrong. Now we got a bigger issue. Yes, sir. Now what they did is like this uh-huh. <laughs> compared to what's going on right here and now. Yes. Hmm? What they're telling me is you don't know what you're talking about. I know God puts you over this, but I can hear from God better about this than you can. And I know better and you need to yield to me. And you need to submit to me. There's been a few times we needed to correct people in the church here. And, I, and the people have said, well, now you always said that we're supposed to be led by the Spirit for ourselves." Absolutely, I said that. Well, then I'm, I don't feel led to yield to you on this. Mm-hmm. See, what has happened there? They've gone beyond... Being led for their self. Now they're trying to be led for us. Do you see that or not? Yes. They're trying to tell us how to be led. And that's so presumptuous. And that's so proud. It's rebellion. That's right. I told these two, I said, guys, this is not going to work now. Aren't you supposed to be helping me do this? Oh, yeah, yeah. And we love you, Brother Keith. I said, great. Yield to me on this. Well, no. You, you can see people's body language. What, what is this? Are they stuck? They're stuck. What does that mean? They're not giving. And the longer I talked about it, the harder they got. I said, well, go home. They said, what? We've got a service. I said, I know. 
We're supposed to do this. I said, not today. You don't qualify. I said, go home. I'll talk to you in two weeks. You don't do anything in, in the ministry to, for these two weeks. Two weeks later, we came. I said, have you all prayed about it some more? Yeah, yeah, we did, we did. Uh, what do you think? Well, we just feel that you're wrong. Now, let's just stop here. I'm a man. I could be wrong. But what if I am? What if I'm just totally wrong? What if I am? There's more, to, more going on here than the issue that we're talking about. Even if you don't think you can respect everything that I am saying or doing, if you don't respect the place then you're not respecting God. Right? And you need to have faith that if I'm messing up, God will deal with me. Right? But you don't want to get in trouble with Him. And how I many know it, it is acceptable as long as I'm not just trying to get you to violate the Bible or something like that. If you say, well, now, Lord, <laughs> I don't feel right about this, but I'm submitting to them and you put them in charge. So, hey, that's between you and them. I'm following orders. Right? And it gives God opportunity because you're actually in faith now. Yes. And you're doing what He told you to do. It gives Him an open door to deal with people. Yes. And show them if they are wrong. Yeah. Oh, but when you do this. I ain't doing it and ain't nobody going to make me do it. They said, well, we have prayed about it. And we have the Holy Spirit just like you do. Disrespectful. Very. Very. You know. The, what these guys had learned about being led by the Spirit, they had learned it from the Lord through me. The last two years, but before that. I'd been in the ministry for years and years. They just got saved not that long ago. But now, they've taken the teachings they got through me and have passed me by whew, in their own mind and are now instructing me. Is there anything wrong with this? so many things wrong with this. And I mean, the longer we talked, the harder they got. Somebody say hard. 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 I said, guys, it's not okay. Now, I need them. They're talented. They're skilled. There's holes in the ministry when they're not doing their job. But there's something more important here. I said, what would you do, Brother Keith? I sent them home. I said... Stay out another two weeks. Pray. You might want to fast some. And we'll talk again. Third time they came in, just as unyielding, I had to let them go. They're not qualified. They don't believe in me. Right? They don't believe I can hear from God. They don't believe in me. They don't believe in the leadership. Do you see this or not? Would that affect some, the, somebody's uh, life, the plan of God for their life? If they're supposed to be there, would it affect, all right, well, I'll just tell you, for the next several weeks and, and months, it hurt us in our, in our ministry. We had holes. Was it God's will that we had a hole and other people had to cover? and make? No, it was not God's will. They were supposed to be in there doing the job. All they would have had to do. All they would have had to do. First five minutes, the first time we talked, is say, I'm sorry, I want to do it the way you want it done. And we'll make that adjustment. And I'd have said, good, let me pray with you. They'd have been out the door, would have had service as normal. Did you hear me? And says, well, you could have given in. No. Hmm. No no. They are not my leader. They're not the one that, you know, the Lord put over me. I have given in to my leaders. I said, I have. Yes, sir. I've done things I didn't think I wanted to do. I've done things I wasn't sure about, you know, that was the right plan for me. I remember serving Brother Hagin. 
And uh, I was helping him in a meeting out west. I had been busy doing other things in our own ministry. And we were kind of integrating back into his flow some. And uh, he called me up on the platform. In his meeting, the place was packed. He said, Keith, you got anything to go here? I said, uh, maybe a teaching, because sometimes he, he had me teach. He said, I don't think so. We know that ought to be enough said. Amen. Right? Ought to be looking for something else. Yes, sir. So I did. I sang a song. And he said, oh, that's not quite it. You got something else? I said, well, I, I got this teaching. <laughs> uh, he said, I, no, I don't think so. I said, okay. So I sang another song. He said, I, I don't think that's quite it. And guess what I said? <laughs> he said, you got something else? I said, well, I think I got this teaching. He said, well, all right, give it out. And he went and sat down. And I gave my teaching. And it was dead. It was empty as last year's bird's nest. It was dead. It was hard. And I struggled through it. Oh, Lord. And we finally closed and we we'll just quit. We just quit is what we did. We just sputtered to a dismal stop and went back to the room. Oh, man, I felt bad. Oh, I felt so bad. Now, I've missed it. Uh, I can do one of two things. Tell me what one of those two directions I can go. What, what can I do? Huh? I can humble myself and admit it and repent. Or what else could I do? Huh? I could harden myself and defend it. Do you hear it? Yeah. Well, yeah, but now I know I heard from the Lord on that, and I, I, I know, and I, I have the Holy Ghost too, and, and, and you're ignorant. <laughs> Talking about me. And I, I went, I'll never forget it. I went, and I didn't know what to do with myself, so I took a bath. In a whirl tub, and I, I was sitting in that whirl tub crying because my heart hurts a bit. Tears are coming down my face. Of course, they mixed in the water, so you couldn't really tell. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> and I got out of there, and I, I went and got the phone. I called Brother Hagen. I said, uh, I said Brother Hagen, I'm, I'm sorry. I missed it. He said, Yep. <laughs> yeah you did I said dad I am so sorry I said I don't know what I was thinking I am sorry he, he said that's alright just don't leave me stay hooked stay I said yes sir yes sir yes sir and we had no problems did you hear me no I mean next next service he called me right up again and I sang songs. <laughs> and he had me teach. He had me teach. But, you know, now, now you, might, you might sit there and think, well, why would you ask that three times? You have done this. You've done this. Don't you think you hadn't? It's easy to sit from another perspective. Why would you do that? Well, I wasn't thinking right. Here's a man. Nearly 60 years in the ministry. I'm Ned in the first reader by him. I'm right. I'm wet behind the ears. He, he's seen more of the move of the Spirit. He, he's had personal visitations with the head of the church. Right? Why would I be so dense? 
as to bring something up another two times after he says, no, I don't think so. That should have been the end of it. Right? Friend, you've got to stir yourself up every day, right? Every situation, with everybody, you've got to know. The Bible said that we are to know those who are over us in the Lord. You to know who they are. You should be able to name them, right? And esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. That should govern your response, your conversation. It's all right to joke. It's all right to have fun. But there's a line you don't cross. Are you listening? And when they turn and tell you something, it's not time to argue. And if it's something different or if it's corrective, it's time to repent. And what if the whole church was operating that way? Imagine what would happen. What if the whole, every local church, what would happen? The membership would just grow and grow and grow. There'd be no splits. People would not be leaving because they're offended and got their feelings hurt and rebellious. So the churches would just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Pastors and ministers would fellowship with each other. They would acknowledge their elders and follow them whether they liked it or not. Did you hear me? There would be this cohesiveness. There would be this unity and this wonderful amazing thing called the church would begin to rise up in the earth as one man and would begin to flex its spiritual muscle, its spiritual authority and the devil cannot stand against it. He cannot hold out against it. Oh, do you see it? Do you believe it? Say it out loud. Rebellion will not dwell in me. Stubbornness Will not live in me. Will not live in me. Oh, hallelujah. Glory. Just praise the Lord for a minute. Lord, we're so thankful. We're so thankful. Stand up on your feet, actually, and just lift up your hands and praise the Lord. Lord, we worship you. We're yielded to you. We honor you. We magnify you. We glorify you. We bless you. We praise you. We honor you. We magnify you. Oh, we worship you. 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 Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, when they came to to take Jesus, he said, uh, the, 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 the prince of this world, he's talking about the, the enemy, he said, he has nothing in me. Say that out loud. The devil has nothing in me. No root of bitterness. No hardness of heart. No stubbornness. No rebellion. No stiff neckness. I will not be like the devil in any degree. I love the Lord. I submit to the Lord. I obey the Lord. I yield to Him. I do not resist Him. Hallelujah. Oh, I yield myself to the Holy Spirit. Everybody say, I yield myself, I yield myself to the unction of God. Oh, I yield myself, yield myself to the Holy Spirit. I will let Him be my guide. Sing it again. I will yield myself. To the Holy Spirit, I'm gonna yield myself, yield myself to the unction of God. I yield myself to the Holy Spirit. Oh, I will. Yourself. 
himself when he's talking to you. Yield yourself even when he's correcting you. Go on and yield yourself. Yield yourself when he's moving on you. Oh, let him be your guide. Every voice, yield myself to the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna yield myself to the unction. Gonna let him be my guide. Many in the earth insist on doing their own thing and running their own life and won't yield to his lordship. But let's affirm or reaffirm it today. Every voice, my TV and internet, everybody. If you're not standing up already, stand up. Lift up your hand before the Lord. Say it out loud, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. He died on the cross. Paid the full price for all my sins. I believe He's raised from the dead. Soon to come again. King of kings. Lord of Lords, and I confess, I submit to God. Jesus is my Lord, and I will not rebel against Him. I will not be stubborn with Him. I submit to my Lord. I yield to my Lord and all that He instructs. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, let the anointing work inside you. I believe there's people here and watching that's been hard-headed and stubborn all their life. They grew up that way. They were taught that kind of thing. But you're changing today. You're receiving the Word of the Lord and hearts are melting. Resistance is going away. Love is coming up. Faith and trust in God is coming up. A yieldedness to obey. Oh, hallelujah. I will yield myself to the Holy Spirit. I will let Him We're going to be dismissed. If you confess Jesus for the first time, don't go out the back. Come down to the front. There will be people standing here ready to talk to you. You need to testify to somebody. If you're watching my TV or internet, call us, write us, email us. Let us rejoice with you and get some good materials in your hand to help you grow up. God is so good. He's never led us astray. He's never lied to us. He's not interested in hurting us. He's only interested in helping us. Why would we ever rebel against Him? Why would we resist Him at all? He loves us. Let's sing it as we go. To the Holy oh, sing it as you go. Spirit, I'm going to yield myself, yield myself to the unction of God. Oh, To the Holy Spirit, I'm gonna let Him be my God. Oh, everybody sing and say, Heal the sin.
Hey guys, uh, while you're leaving, remember the ones that uh, raise their hand. If you got a testimony, find Nancy or Jill or myself as you're going, and uh, be sure and get a form to fill out with so we can have those for Mrs. Moore. Thank y'all.